Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media for our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Heather Conley. I direct our Europe, Russia, and Eurasia program. And we are delighted today to be in partnership with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in a series of conversations that looks at Chancellor Angela Merkel's legacy. And today's conversation is going to focus on the Western Balkans. We uh, have a lot to talk about and because this is a very active region, but, but first let me turn to my colleague Polinars, who is the North America Director of the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, to say a few words of warm welcome. Paul, over to you. Thank you, dear Heather. Good morning also from my side to our participants in the US. Good afternoon to our participants in Europe. A very warm welcome also to our two distinguished panelists today. Peter Bayer, member of the German Bundestag, coordinator of transatlantic co uh, uh, relations in the German Federal Foreign Office, and Western Balkans rapporteur of, for the German parliament has been with us in Washington DC just a few days ago for two events after months without traveling due to COVID. Back in Germany, he's joining us today online from his hometown, I guess. Happy to have you with us, Peter. Also, of course, James O'Brien, vice chair at the Albright Stonebridge Group. Heather is going to introduce you later on from my side. Thank you so much for joining us, Jim, as well. I'm really grateful to Heather Connolly and CSIS for hosting today's event with us. CSIS pays a lot of attention to the situation and developments in the Western Balkans, rightfully so. As we all remember during the 90s, the US was the driving force within the international community in order to end the bloodshed in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo. For years, Washington supported reconstruction and stabilization of the Western Balkans very much in line with NATO and the EU. Yet, let's say 10 to 15 years ago, the US engagement was significantly reduced. Since then, the Western Balkans have experienced very difficult years. The United States and Europe face an increasing competition for influence in the region with countries like China and Russia, among others. There is a growing concern in the US that the EU might not be able, at least not enough, be able to strengthen political and economic stability in the Western Balkans on its own. During the various high-ranking meetings and summits in Europe, the Biden administration has put the topic back on the agenda. Today, we want to learn more about possible transatlantic approaches and perhaps different perspectives on how to assist and support the region. Heather Conley will lead us through today's discussion. And as always, dear Heather, I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Paul, thank you so much. A great introduction, and I am very excited to get started. I want to remind our audience that we want you to participate in this conversation as well. So on the event page, you'll see a live question button. Please push that button and please submit your questions. So I'm going to begin with, with Peter Bayer, uh, and then I will turn to Jim O'Brien and give him the quality introduction that he richly deserves. But let me start with, uh, with Peter. Uh, and I should note, a member of parliament since 2009, and you are in the throes of a very busy campaign season. So we're even uh, more grateful that you could spend some, some time with us. But Peter, my first question to you is, in your mind, what is is Chancellor Merkel's legacy, her policy legacy for the Western Balkans. She's really put her personal sweat equity uh, into this region, understanding its priorities. But I would welcome your thoughts on her legacy. And then perhaps you could offer some thoughts on what the next German government, how it will approach policy towards the Western Balkans. Welcome uh, again, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Heather. It's good to see you all here. And thanks to Konrad Adenauer von Dietation as well as CSIS. And good to see you, Jim, also. Um, yeah, when you ask me what is the legacy of uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel with regard to the Western Balkans, um, I think you already put it, put it in the right direction. She was 
always, to say the least, very much interested in this region because Angela Merkel always understood how important stability, peace in this region, in the six countries, um, if we count them all together, in this group of nations um, of the Western Balkans, they are surrounded by EU member states, so they're in the heart of the of the European Union, but not a member of the, of the European Union. And concretely, she was the uh, initiator of the so-called Berlin process. I think uh, that is something that is uh, we're really uh, or that that, uh, that I would personally describe as the core part of the legacy when it comes to Western Balkans, something that has um, uh, brought things forward. She was the initiator. The Berlin process uh, is still ongoing, has a little bit slowed down, we have to um, admit. So it needs to have new impulses, but that is uh, what we probably going to talk about later on during this um, discussion. The second part of your question was mm, what to expect from the next German government, because as everybody probably knows, um, end of September, we will have general elections here in Germany to the federal parliament, the Bundestag, and then also a completely new German government, uh, a new coalition government. How will that look like? I, I don't know. But um, with regard to um, international relations, foreign policy, uh, there's some great likelihood that we will see a continuation of what we've seen under the Merkel uh, times and Merkel government. Um, I, I just hope and um, I will certainly play my part as much as I can um, that uh, the, you know, the, the, the success of government here in Germany will be at least as much dedicated to the in European integration of the, Europe, of the Western Balkan countries as uh, the current one is, uh, was. Um, I, say, I said at least as engaged because I think... Um, we need uh, uh, new uh, impulses. Um, you know, that, that is something that we will discuss a little bit later, but uh, we need to be stronger. Uh, we still have five uh, EU member countries that have, for example, not recognized uh, Kosovo. Um, that is an embarrassment, as I think. There is a lot of explanations why these respective five EU member countries have not done so yet. Domestic, domestic politics. Um, but um, that is uh, that that is something that uh, that is that 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 needs to be addressed. And I would I would like to see a s even stronger commitment and uh, more of a leadership when it comes to this region because it's so not only dear to our hearts but it's super important for for the European continent that we see more leadership um, in, in that region with regard to political strategies, but also and then you know in transatlantic relations. Um, there's there's a lot of potential where we can do things together uh, more much better than during the past four years under the previous uh, administration uh, in the United States. But also we have to admit the European Union has not been as committed and as strong and, and as harmonized and unanimous as it should be should have been. Um, but there are points of good transatlantic cooperation where we can really do something in the spirit of uh, division of labor between EU and the United States of America. Peter, thank you. And it's exactly those impulses that we want to figure out and those new policy approaches that I think will be so essential. Let me welcome uh, Jim O'Brien uh, to the conversation. Jim is vice chair uh, of the Albright Stonebridge Group, a part of the Denton's Global Advisors. He leads their Europe practice. But we know Jim uh, as such a stalwart uh, as far as the Western Balkans regions. He's served two previous U.S. administrations as a special presidential envoy, one uh, one time securing uh, the release of American hostages held overseas, as well as overseeing U.S. policy planning towards the Balkans. So a lot of this architecture we're going to talk about uh, has a lot of Jim's uh, fingerprints all over it. And Jim, you just returned from the region. So I think I'm going to begin. Um, uh, give us your overall impressions of, of the region and some of the initiatives that you're working on right now uh, as part of those new policy impulses that we so urgently need as far as transatlantic approach to the Western Balkans. 
Um, thanks. Thanks, Heather. And I, I agree with everything Peter just said. And thanks, Paul, for the introduction as well. I think your introduction to me, Heather, just means that I used to be the youngest person in most of these meetings. And now I'm not. The, um, but, but yeah, I, I just a couple points. I mean, one is on Chancellor Merkel's um, legacy for the region. I actually think it's it's one of the things most admirable about her. Because when she was running for office, many people in her party and even she associated themselves with a vision of of the Balkans as other, that it was it was going to be maybe perhaps not membership, but a bit of a partnership, somehow not really part of the union's future. And she learned and changed and began to see significant reason for greater integration and greater involvement with the region. And in particular, I give her credit for the Berlin process and the creation of the, the regional coordination body, the RCC. I think this is one of the most innovative things that the international community has done for the, the region. And it, it really came from her desire to help these countries work with each other as they started to learn to work with Europe itself. And, and, I, and so I think that's an area where I hope there's more transatlantic engagement even following her departure from office, because it's it's been a really good thing. But but mostly this spirit of somebody who learned while in office is is not something. Apologies to your profession, Peter, but it's not something we often see from elite, elected leaders. And and I, I really I, I find it one of her best characteristics. So so that's what I one of the pieces of her legacy. I hope we take with her. In terms of the U.S., the transatlantic relationship broadly, I'd say I think the important thing is not to have the U.S. support the European perspective. It's to work with Europe to make the European perspective real. What, what I hear from across the, the, say, the six in the region is they don't believe it anymore. Right. We've reached there's the old Soviet joke. Right. We, we pretend to work. They pretend to pay us. And I think they're kind of stopping pretending right now. And that's giving rise to some of the worst populist and nationalist impulses, but it's also giving rise to some positive impulses. And I think we have to be able to, to give them real hope. And, and maybe the most important symbol coming very early in the new German um, government's time will be whether there's a possibility of opening chapters with Albania and North Macedonia. Um, I, I think Bulgaria's position has no support in the EU. This has become, for the Western Balkans and for Americans, this has become a test of whether the EU is able to function, right? You have 26 agreed and one not. And so why is this not happening? It's even less an issue about the actual specifics, which are often um, baffling and, and evolving, you know, with Bulgaria's requests of North Macedonia. Um, I think, so that's one test. I also think an early test um, to, to call the U.S. administration to make real its commitment to fight corruption. I mean, they've, they've done some very interesting things with executive orders recently, but, but I think to, to make that a real focus and have reform efforts look at corruption is an area to, to, to work on. Now, just quickly to what I was doing. So I was I was in the region last week. I was in Skopje when the, the leaders of Serbia, Albania, and North Macedonia announced their intention to move forward toward a true single market. And and there are a number of cultural elements to this, but the, the two highlights are by the start of next year, they want workers to be able to move freely among the countries and go look for work, get work without a lot of let's say, Yugo nostalgic requirements for registration and, and monitoring by, by the interior ministries. This will be critical for the economic future of the region. If you look at the region, only Serbia is getting a lot of investment that puts it into European value chains. That's how countries get wealthy. They, they, they start to feed into the value chains of, of more wealthy neighbors. But Serbia is the one attracting those investments. Serbia's labor force is not large enough to manage the demand that's coming toward it. So for Serbia to continue to grow and to move up, it has to be able to send factories to other countries or have workers come into Serbia. And this is a critical point for the region's future. The second thing they're gonna do 
is to arrange for no stop borders by the start of 2023. And the way they want to do this is just adopt exactly the software the EU uses that allows a truck to be loaded in Germany and drive directly to France without spending 12 hours at a border. Right, right now in the Balkans, the World Bank estimates trucks spend 80% of their time waiting at border crossings. And when you're in tiny jurisdictions, that makes no sense. So it's impossible for Serbia or a company in Albania to outsource to North Macedonia because they can't move the goods back and forth. So, so this is what they're trying to do. Now, why do I think this is worth spending a little time on? Because this has been a goal ever since the Berlin process was announced in 2014. It's because here you have three countries saying, we're going to do this ourselves. We're going to move forward now with three. We're happy if the other three want to join us but we're not waiting. And this will take some change from the transatlantic community because we have been very invested in trying to make sure that the six all move forward together. And the problem is that that means that nothing happens until everything is agreed. And often political issues intrude and make it impossible so that um, you know, the, earlier this year, the six tried to agree on a statement about the need for more investment. They couldn't agree on it because one country had an objection, right? They couldn't agree on a statement about the desire to deepen the Berlin process. They couldn't agree to a, some things they've, they've all signed up to in the context of the, you know, on and on. There've been seven or eight regional meetings at which no result has emerged because political issues prevent the six from going forward together. So this brings us back to the spirit of, of Chancellor Merkel. The international community has asked that the six always move in lockstep moving forward to create a single market. And now we have the really, frankly, the three largest players saying, we wanna, we wanna set the path for everyone. And if they wanna come, that's fine. So the question is to us, are we gonna support that? Or are we going to say, no, you have to keep working only at six, even though we know that's not working. I think the innovation that we saw in the creation of the Berlin process leads us to say, you know, we probably have to listen to the region a little more and, and let's start setting a positive example rather than waiting. But I think that's the challenge we're going to face over the next couple months, and I hope we, we do it together across the ocean. Jim, thank you so much. And, and I think there's so many really important points. I think that first is, you know, no longer can U.S. policy just say, Europe, this is yours. You take this, sure. you finish it. Uh, we'll support it. But we have to have a joint engagement strategy. We, we both have to be deeply involved to, to get this right. Uh, but you're absolutely right. What the Open Balkans Initiative doing is something quite different. We've grown so accustomed to nothing moving. Now something is moving. And that is now causing some concern about, uh-oh, are we leaving behind and those that are being left behind, how will they respond? So, Peter, let me turn to you. Would love your reflections on the Open Balkans initiative. And we certainly got a great audience question wanting to learn more about that. So, Jim, you've already taken one audience question off the, off the page now. Uh, and I'd also, Peter, like to see where the Berlin process so strongly focused on regional cooperation. To answer Jim's question, anti-corruption, all the research that CSIS has done across this region points to uh, a strong anti-corruption focus, civil society focus. We haven't been successful at the government to government level, unfortunately. How do we rethink anti-corruption? So love your reflections on, on those two. Thank you for so much. Um, and thanks for the for, for these um, really um, great thoughts and ideas, um, Jim. Uh, listen very carefully. It, 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 when, when we when we talk about all the, the, the six countries, uh, it's indeed that we started off by putting them all together in one cluster and say, you know, uh, with regard to regional cooperation, with regard to all of the above, uh, you know, reform of the judiciary, fight against corruption and organized crime, and even this parallel thing called EU enlargement process or accession process, um, and we've put them all together. But now, I mean, over time, we have to learn. But I want to start off with one, one remark that comes increasingly to my mind when I when I when, when I when I you know speak with people in the region, but also if I exchange my views and ideas, uh, just like with you guys today. All of the players in the region, in the six countries of the Western Balkans, 
uh, you know, and, and the and the think tankers and the the administrations and all of the capitals, and, uh, both in in Washington and also in the European Union, we all know what needs to be done. And yes, they need facilitation, they need support, money, but only strategic support, orientation. But this is, you know, sometimes I, 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 over the years I, I came to the impression that you know sometimes I have to wonder: um, Do the actors really want all of that? Because in some of the capitals, you know, just to be very, very, very diplomatic here. Um, there, those in those in office are quite fine, I guess, with this with the current situation. Um, they become rich persons; they have a lot of power and influence, so that they get along quite well. Um, and also between them, just if we look to Serbia and Kosovo, um, there is so much historic burden that they carry with them on their shoulders. So if we just briefly, you know, switch to this um, this EU enlargement process, uh, you know, with, with, with the, uh, switch to the uh, to the dialogue process, normalization between Serbia and Kosovo, then they have met again in Brussels under the auspices of <laughs> of the European Union and with our special envoy Miroslav Lajca. But you know, then they meet there, and there's a lot of ideology involved. Nothing really moves. They got stuck. So is there? Sometimes I think, is there really the serious political will to improve things? Do they, the current actors, really want uh, an advance in the normalization process and thus uh, EU enlargement and then regional cooperation? I know there's a lot of opposition in Kosovo uh, with regard to the, you know, until very recently called mini Schengen. Uh, uh, um, a project which is now called Open Balkans, and uh, uh, um, um, which which aims at a better uh, regional economic cooperation, uh, because they feel like threatened by the big countries, like especially by Serbia. And I think if I read that correctly, if I followed that correctly, just recently yesterday or the day before yesterday, there was some public statements by Albin Kurti. Um, uh, Prime Minister of, of 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 Kosovo saying, "Well, this only this is only this all only opens not the Balkans for you know more regional economic cooperation, but it opens it up for Chinese and Russian influence. So they feel like, like some are left left out, and they they feel inferior to that idea. But then again, if we come briefly back to the Berlin process, the idea behind that was an eco was a more regional cooperation. Uh, that they do things together, so that goes a lot. This West, this mini Schengen and open Balkans goes a lot in the direction of the original idea of the Berlin process. So I think we cannot say, well, this is something evil, something that is not needed or wanted. Um, so I would advocate, uh, uh, Heather, because you asked me what my reflection is on the open Balkans project, is be part of it of this. Uh, you know, if, if you, there, there's the invitation, Kosovo can be part of this and uh, be a strong player as, as, as well. Uh, they should overcome the historic and ideologic, uh, you know, uh, um, things and burden that they carry with them on their shoulders. I know it's difficult and it's easy for me to say that as a German, um, but, uh, you know, for, 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 the, for, the, for the benefit of the citizens of all of the countries, I think um, it's a good project. Jim, let me turn to you uh, because we know you have to leave a few minutes earlier. So I want to pick your brain and then Peter and I will continue on the, the conversation. Uh, two areas of, of concern, and I really want to welcome your thoughts. The first is Serbia-Kosovo normalization. Um, and this is um, the previous administration um, it placed enormous pressure on uh, Kosovo and, um, and supported uh, Serbia. Where should the new process be, uh, and and how do we balance uh, U.S. approaches there? And then I want to ask you about Bosnia uh, before you go. And then I'm Peter. I'm going to come to you with this question because our audience has asked 
you know, obviously 25 years after the Dayton Peace Accords, um, Bosnia now is using its uh, its calcification, if you will, uh, to not further its progress, but to prevent its progress. And Christian Smith, who is now the new uh, high representative in Bosnia, you now have Republic Srpska that's not even uh, accepting his appointment. Uh, they're now you know, uh, the, the genocide denial uh, is now testing OHR and their rules. Where do you see this going? What's the role of the U.S. here in all of this? And with those two huge questions, we'll let you finish. We'll say goodbye. And then, Peter, I'm going to have you pick up on those questions. Uh, Jim, over to you. Um, goodness. The uh, so I appreciate, uh, Peter, I think those were really thoughtful remarks. I'll say I got involved in the support of the Berlin process and the common market, now open Balkan, um, because, because of Kosovo and Kosovo-Serbia. You know, Kosovo is a landlocked, recently conflict-ridden state, and those are the two biggest indicators of state failure in any research done since, since World War II. Um, and at the same time, it has educated, incredibly innovative population with great networks around the world. And if they can find a way to be involved in commerce more broadly, the state can be a great success. Um, but as it stands now, the last review I saw said, if a German company wants to outsource to Slovakia, it costs them five euro and takes five days to get the part back. If they go to Kosovo, now I always reverse these two numbers, but it was something like it costs 66 euro and takes 76 days. That, you know, there's no way out except to be part of a larger market, and that can't be right now. So I really hope that Kosovo can find its way to participate in this, in this initiative. On the bilateral discussions, I think right now it's become a circus that each side uses to play to its domestic constituencies. Um, you know, the meeting that took place two weeks ago in Brussels was, um, I think, very contentious and unable to get onto a, really any constructive agenda, except a little on missing persons. But when asked whether they would return in the fall, both, both parties said, absolutely, because it's good politics at home. Um, so, so I think Miro Lychek is an enormously creative man. I just think that this agen agenda that they're working on now is not one where either can work together. So I think we need to find a way for it to become, a one, a transatlantic issue, where the U.S. needs to make clear to both of the new leaders in Kosovo that they're going to have to engage constructively. And the European side, I think, makes clear to Serbia that it has real prospects, but that it's going to have to do something. With Serbian elections next year and the possibility of early elections in Kosovo being kind of rumored, you know, I'm skeptical that that stuff will will come out. Okay, I, I just dropped in the rumor of early elections in Kosovo. I don't want anyone to think I know anything, but um, it, 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 it seems a possibility. That, um, uh, so I am very skeptical that the current framework will produce much. Um, I hope it can maybe work on a couple of practical items, particularly the fate of the missing who have waited too long and, um, and you know, potentially one or two of the other issues about just technical adjustments along the border, particularly managing the water resources that are, again, existential for Kosovo. So whatever the lake is called. Um, and, and I think generally the, um, the U.S. should make clear that it's not going to support any, any border adjustment. You know, I think the real mistake in the last administration was, I, I believe Kosovo felt the U.S. and Berlin together would put a stop to the speculation, and so it, it allowed the talks to go forward a little bit, and then the U.S. surprised um, all of our partners by changing position in a pretty dramatic way. And I just think that's, um, wh whether it's right or wrong, it was very poor statecraft, and um, I think we need to correct that. But, but then they can have a real discussion. Um, on Bosnia, I, I want to applaud High Representative Insko for the, the um, executive order. I think it was a, a really bold step. He's doing it on his way out. He creates some instability that, that 
also brings with it some openings. I mean, it's got, there's a cost to it, but I think it's an important topic. And it, it is the, the European way, and I think the transatlantic approach to the issue. So I think he was right. Now, why does this matter? It's because in one sense, Bosnia is an enormous success. If you look at the World Bank research on conflicts, the strongest indicator of a conflict is that you had a conflict within the previous 10 years. Almost every country that's been that divided by war returns to war quickly. And Bosnia has had 25 years of peace. Now, as one of the people who wrote a lot of the Dayton Agreement, I'll say the reason it worked is that it essentially allowed the warring parties to convert their wartime, their guns, into money. And we keep paying them every year because they have captured the state and, and have a very um, comfortable life uh, of, of seeing the country as essentially three constituencies. So the question for current policymakers is whether they maybe want to disrupt that degree of comfort and what risk they're taking by doing so. The approach I would, and I think what, what um, I hear Mr. Dodik is creating himself a strategic problem because he is calling into question the framework that has allowed peace to stay in place. When he continues to talk of secession, which was directly ruled out at Dayton and is not possible under the Dayton framework. Um, and when he says he will not accept the civilian high representative who was um, it, it created by Dayton, he then makes it easier for the international community to say, okay, maybe we need to look at some other parts here too. And what I would do is focus very strongly on the issue of state capture, the the way in which the the state op operatives control large enterprises, the contracts that flow from them, the money that goes from them to political parties. Um, these are all problems the EU has addressed in other Canada countries, and it can address in Bosnia. It will change the political economy of the country and make it possible for there to be more open political um, uh, competition. So that's the approach I would take. But Jim, thank I've, I've you. Been, I can stay a couple minutes if someone wants to react to that. But oh. I'm, Great. No, we'll take every minute you can give us. Thank you. You know that that was in, uh, really really important. And uh, Peter, I'm wondering. I, I love Jim. Your framing of sort of the circus, like we're both leaders. This isn't about trying to achieve normalization. This is about uh, being entrenched in your political positions. I, I mean, shameless plug here. We wrote a piece a few months ago that said, you know what? Perhaps we should stop the circus and break this into two. Meaning we continue to work very closely with Belgrade to, to get some movement on the implementation of agreements already reached. And we stop forcing these two together to prove political points that are actually moving the process backwards, not force uh, forwards, that we work with them very clearly. Uh, I would welcome your, your thoughts on, do we just have to have a new approach here? Because doing what we're doing is, I think, working against normalization. Yeah, I think it's always good to learn over the time uh, you know, if things are not going the way, not as fast as we would uh, like them to see because we think it would be better. So I certainly welcome all good ideas, constructive ideas, um, be it from CSIS or somebody else. Um, and I, I mean, I, there's, there's also some, a certain, certain level of frustration because we see uh, again, things get stuck and not, it's not moving as fast as it previously was. I mean, um, if we look to Serbia, you know, I would also say, uh, list, uh, um, list the Montenegro. For some while, they were, you know, advancing, uh, doing things, but they have the domestic problems. And then I, I repeat consciously uh, what I said earlier that, you know, some of the governments or some people, individuals in these governments, be quite comfortable with the current situation, but that is something where I always think, um, you know, the also with regard to the men mentality of the region, I think they we need to show a more engagement. Um, if if I look to the role of uh, Miroslav Lajčak, a special envoy, which is a great position to have, and I still remember when I talked with von der Leyen just very briefly after she got into office. Um, uh, and uh, when there was a, still a fresh idea to to have somebody taking care from the EU, EU side, other than the high representative uh, himself uh, for, 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 for foreign politics of the EU, 
Um, that was something that was, I welcomed that very much. It's good to have Miroslav Lajcak as a special envoy. But so I sometimes, and he has a great agenda and he's a great guy and so on and so on. But and he's, uh, as Jim put it, he's very creative, but he needs support. And what can he do if, if you know, not all, all of the EU member countries are behind him and his work. And it seems to be that that, that is uh, uh, the fact of the matter. So I, I would like I, I would I, I think it would would uh, would be would be good to have a strong stronger role of the special envoy when Serbia and Kosovo meets in Brussels or wherever when they lead the dialogue that because currently it's more the special envoy's role is more of a moderator rather than a director really who pushes and um, excuse my French to kick ass at some times. Because that is the language I think that is needed, and that they understand much better. It's you know it, it's so easy and boring currently that from time to time, uh, Vucic and Kurti or whoever is in the respective uh, you know positions in these in these countries meet and they part, and then you know there are some prerequisites of with regard to um, you know that you, first you have to completely recognize my my country that is Kosovo before we do anything. You know, I think pr pra pragmatism is something that is really needed in that regard, and we can help them. We together transatlantically to help them um, for with regard to the normalization process. Pragmatic approaches, open Balkans could be one of these pragmatic approaches. There's so much politics involved and, and, and ideology, and again, I repeat that consciously. Um, help them to come up with pragmatic approaches. Uh, Heather, when you mentioned earlier. Um, uh, <laughs> agreements um, and implement them, yes. But I, 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 I now I'm, I'm a little bit ironic. I, I certainly not hope that you mean the Washington Agreement, where both Vucic and by that time of Dula Hoti were were more or less um, summoned to the Oval Office under the Trump administration, and they had to sign something that is still in place. But some of the points were not new; others were ridiculous. And others probably will not be followed now under the new administration. Um, but yes, again, coming back to your initial question, of, of course we need uh, uh, we need lessons learned, and we have need no new approaches. As you know, there is a new methodology when it comes to the European enlargement process, where we build clusters. I'm still not super convinced, but I'm learning if that is a better approach to help these countries to reform the judiciary. To reform, uh, you know, to fight against corruption and organized crime, because these things are are at the core of uh, the improvement of the state structures. And only if there's more, you know, there's a re reliable rule of law, a reliable judiciary, deep, uh, 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 de you know, the, the, the state capture these structures. If they, they, that if they could be broken through, that builds trust not only among the the people in the region, but uh, for foreign foreign investors, if they, if there's a re reliable state system, a re reliable judiciary, then that also brings foreign investors that are creating jobs much better and easier into the country. And I think that is what we need. So we need to learn here and find these pragmatic approaches. Jim, before you go, what can the U.S. do to support uh, High Representative Schmidt in Sarajevo? Uh, or further elaborate on the state capture. Um, this is a really critical moment uh, for Bosnia. Where, if you were advising the Biden administration, what would you, what would your advice be to High Representative Schmidt? Ooh. Um. Only the easy ones here at CSIS, Jim. Only yeah. the easy ones. I, I think where the U.S. The U.S. always has three advantages um, to, to bring to bear. One, one is the ability to use coercive measures, um, and often those are sanctions, um, but, but you know, at times there can be um, uh, even more. But, but I think the Biden administration, with the executive order that that uh, says anyone who who threatens the stability of the region can can find himself under sanctions um, can use that in a way to to address the financial underpinnings of the the leaders who are creating instability. 
Um, hopefully the EU would work with us on that, but I understand the EU structure is slightly different on those things. Um, sometimes the, the coercive measure is more just jawboning, making clear that there will be consequences. Um, the, the second piece is the ability to work with the, the select capitals. And so I think the US should be working to create a strong friends group for the high representative. This effort comes in, you know, waxes and wanes, but I, I think it, you know, certainly should include, I think Berlin, probably Paris, um, given its interest in the enlargement methodology. And um, as well as, you know, I don't want to leave anybody out, but, I, you know, Vienna, um, the Hague, a few of the others, to to then make sure that in unison we're making clear the consequences for for behavior that that disputes the integrity of the the high rep and the ability to work, um, and I think with that then is a third, which is the the ability to really focus on the trouble spots. I think the the EU does have to address the neighborhood as a potential member or at least a member of the single market and the trading zone even if not you know the even if the political ties come later whereas the the u.s can focus on the the points that are particularly problematic and i think it's important that that be done as a piece of a strategy so just to give an example 20 years ago we were very worried that the parties in bosnia left over from wartime were capturing the main economic parts of the state and um, working with the high rep at the time and, and with various European capitals, you know, things changed very quickly. And the, the money that flowed to what was then the SDS and the old Hadezed um, was taken away. Um, and you saw on the Bosniak side, the SDA split and with the SBIH, and, and you suddenly had democratic competition among each of the three constituencies and a non-nationalist government elected at the central level. The difficulty was that never was folded into a broader state building strategy. And within a couple of years, it became very easy for new players to emerge and dominate each one of the three constituencies. So I think there, uh, and I was part of that US focus, I think for a variety of reasons, we just weren't able to, to make that six month surge into a five year program. And, and I think that's probably what has to happen, especially with a new high rep starting in office just now. But I have to say all of those are just really agenda items with a lot of lack of clarity around them. But I hope it's the start of an, an answer. Oh, Jim, no, that was fantastic. And, and Peter, let me just uh, make sure, I mean, Christian Schmidt, a very senior German uh, figure, official, meant, known very well to many of us in Washington. His appointment was problematic. It was very bumpy, uh, not just because uh, there was Russian strong disagreement, but even, you know, there was some, some friction, I think, even amongst that decision. Just to be clear, uh, Berlin, fully behind Christian. What is the German government doing to support him? And I love Jim's idea of this friends group because his job is incredibly difficult. Any ideas of, of how both this and a future government will fully support Christian Schmidt and his mission in Bosnia? Yeah, uh, Christian Schmidt. It, it was a was a bumpy road for him to to the final vote in, in, the, in the UN Security Council, and I applaud him, congratulate him. He just took office on August first, and on Sunday, which just some days back, I um, was on the phone with him. He's a he's a good, he's a great colleague. I've done I've traveled the region together with him earlier in earlier years very knowledgeable. So, uh, you know, him being there goes back to a proposal, to a personal proposal by the German Chancellor Angela Merkel. So right from day one, he had a lot of support. Uh, but since then, I mean, he also <laughs> needed a lot of uh, own initiatives and engagement to work his th way through um, all the pitfalls. And so on. I, I don't know if he expected that to happen uh, before, but uh, I think he came stronger out of it. So he is where he is now. And um, yeah, concrete ideas. Uh, I haven't heard about the, the, those so far, but I certainly know that he got a lot of support by the current German German government with regard to personnel and you know direct line to the chancellor. So there's a there's a lot of help and support. He's not left alone. There's also also there was this uh, notion, as you know, that um, you know, do we need the high rep anymore? You know, should it should it not 
be, you know, should should we not let let it expire? But here comes now a German, very senior former federal minister guy who has a lot of international experience. And I think it shows, uh, sends out a very strong signal from Germany and from the international community that we care and that we want, uh, we, we are not giving up uh, on that region, on that, on that country with, the, with, the, with very different uh, legal entities and or constituencies there. Uh, and and that, that already shows there's a, there's a lot of support from, from Germany also there. And, um, uh, that, that will also go through the next, uh, all the way through the next German government. I don't see um, anything that would like weaken his support. He would get that, and uh, but you know the France group idea is is, is, ex is excellent. I don't know if that has been considered before, but I would I, I, I took some notes down, so I would certainly uh, um, uh, forward that idea to to Christian Schmidt, who's a very good person, a friend of mine, and uh, yeah, so uh, there, there's there's no doubt that there will be support. Otherwise, he would not be there uh, at all. So uh, while I have you both here, the last couple of rounds are two questions. Um, and Jim, you touched on it. Why have there been so many non-papers swirling around about uh, bo moving borders, land swaps? We have now seen different mysterious papers circulating. Uh, is this frustration, again, of the, the, the stagnation of the region that all of the churn just hasn't created the momentum? Does it mean that we're going back and revisiting this question? Uh, what do you make of it, Jim? And certainly from the, if you were, were you hearing any of this in your recent visits to the region? Um, if you believe the Yancha inspired press in Slovenia, this was all a CIA mid-level plot. Um, but that's clearly nonsense. The, um, I think there's always a smart person, typically a boy, who thinks, if I could just make one tweak, everything would be fine. And I've been hearing this for 30 years. Um, None of those, everyone could explain to me the next border change they want to make, but no one can tell me what the last border change is going to be. So I, I think it's, it's, it's just uh, nightmare dreams of the um, careless and ill-prepared. Um, and I, now what's interesting is when I'm with the leaders talking about the common market and, and with the three most recently, but with you know, others um, from from several of the other states, they don't talk about this. It's not part of their plan for the region. It's, it's again, it's part of the international community looking for the one button we need to push. And, and I think it's really important we just say stop that and let's work on the real work. I don't know, Peter, what do you think? Yeah, Peter, and please, and speaking of Prime Minister Jancha, uh, this uh, Slovene uh, EU rotating presidency will be hosting a Western Balkans conversation. Peter, any predictions of what that will accomplish? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I hope there won't be so many uh, uh, so many authors of yet another non-paper. <laughs> uh, it doesn't help. Um, I think some are just out there to disturb the processes uh, who do not want surely not believe in an advance uh, of the re for the region um, and who do not have good intentions. Briefly, with regard to border adjustments, swap of territories, um, you know, sometimes people think, well, these are old ideas that will never come up again. But Jim put it very, very, very correctly. He said, well, there, it's, it's always out there. I haven't been following that for 30 years because I'm only in politics since 2009, but certainly I was interested before that. But uh, this will never dry out. There, there will always be someone really coming up with that idea and everybody gets very nervous. So now we get even frightened because uh, you know, my, my, my conviction is that it's opening the, the, the box of, of Pandora and uh, that there will be yet another idea somewhere else, a little border adjustment, it's not so evil but it doesn't solve anything. It only causes, uh, you know, new, 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 new problems. So I'm strictly against that. We should not even start that in politics, that, that, that discussion. So with regard to the, to the council presidency, I hope that that will 
that 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 you know has has has, has dried out is, is, is dead that idea. Uh, but certainly, we we, we will uh, be very alert um, and uh, very very much observing in detail what this presidency uh, wants to do with uh, the Western Balkans. We should have, and I think we have, a quite clear um, clear uh, pr um, ideas what we where we think the Western Balkans should be headed towards and how that should look like. Uh, we, do, we need to be pragmatic, not ideologic, um, overcome the, the historic burden. And um, you know, let's work together. I mean, there's so much work to do. Sometimes I'm frustrated again, said, well, let, let, let them all do their own stuff. But then a second later, I think, no, it's worthwhile because it's, uh, it's good for the people, for the citizens, and it's good for the European Union. The, again, again, I mean, they're surrounded by EU member countries. The European Union as a whole should have a, a have a, 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 um, a you know harmonized interest and a strong interest in stability in that region and in prosperity for that region. And um, should well, the only the only um, uh, the, these are European countries, and uh, still the majority of the citizens of these countries have a huge interest in joining the West, the European Union. But they are getting frustrated. Visa liberalization promise not kept yet by the European Union and some other things. We need to engage more. And um, uh, EU accession process is up for the European Union. But again, what I mentioned earlier, division of labor with our American friends. You have, you guys have so much influence there. And I think just recently in Pristina there was this uh, statue. Uh, for for Joe Biden's son there and to honor him that what was 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 uh, was unveiled so that shows how strong both both sides of the Atlantic what strong position and influence have there and let's use that jointly together uh, and then I think we can do really some some good work there and if I, I agree and that was a very heartwarming moment but just what what I hear the leaders talk about is let's make the borders not matter rather than let's move them and they've all learned the lesson of Chinese investment. They don't want it. So part of the reason they're getting, I mean, they, they know they will have some, right? But they don't want to face a Montenegro situation. And, and so part of the reason they want to have larger economic units is so they can attract bigger players from the, um, the, the US, the EU, and other places. As it is, the only substantial players who show up often are the, the particularly the Chinese, never really the Russians at uh, the last 10 years. Um, and, and so this is our moment to try to change the, the gravity of the situation. Well, I, I would agree with that. I think Serbia is the outlier in proactively seeking that Chinese investment. But, but I agree, the pragmatism um, of, of making uh, the situation better and improving lives is so important. Well, and, and, and in some ways, I was going to ask about uh, Chinese and Russian influence, but in some ways, I'm glad we didn't talk about that because I find often that we talk about the Western Balkans through the lens of Chinese influence or Russian influence. And we need to understand this region for U.S. and European strategic interests and talk about our approaches to them rather than talking about other countries' approaches. Uh, thank you so much. This has been uh, an incredible conversation. We need to continue it clearly. Uh, I think, you know, understanding uh, Chancellor Merkel's legacy of the Berlin process and regional cooperation uh, but the work still needs to be done. Unfortunately, we for far too long have not deeply engaged in this region with new ideas, new impulses, focusing on state corruption. But uh, I know we'll have new ideas and, and, and new purpose, uh, particularly after the new German government forms, I think. And Peter, we wish you the very best of luck in, in your election campaign. Jim, we're glad you're safe and sound back from the region and providing us with your, uh, your important insights. And of course, we thank our audience as well as the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for providing us with this platform to talk about these important issues. So from all of us uh, at CSIS, thank you so much for joining us. Be safe, be well, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Everyone. Thanks, Heather. Bye.